So, as we come today uh, to the first day of the season of Advent, we are reminded of the beginning of John's Gospel. The Word became human and lived here on earth among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the only Son of the Father. As we come to this time of worship, let's start with a song which uh, I think is appropriate. Give thanks, not just today, but forever, because that is what our Lord and Saviour does each day. We give thanks for him and for the things that he does. Let's give thanks.
himself. And he goes, where would he go, do you think? If this is the first Sunday of Advent, where would he go? It's the first Sunday, so he goes right at the very beginning. Look, we're going to put our, our little elf on the first, and we're going to remember, we'll put it here, we'll put it here, okay. All right, now what else have I got in here? Black candle holder, ready for something, isn't it? I'll put it on the communion table. I'll put it there. And we want we want something to go in it, don't we? So I found this in the coffee lounge and I haven't paid for it yet. I'll find a I owe for this, but this is a special candle, and it's got, if you can see, it's got numbers up, and it leads right to 25, right to 25. <laughs> Christmas Day. So everything that we have leads up to Christmas Day, doesn't it? I'm going to place this then, there, right. Oh, this this one. Oh, now we're talking, says Janet. Yes, yeah, she's another one who loves chocolate. Now that's got special windows on, hasn't it? Can you see? So, have how many of you got these sort of things at home? Yeah. Already. Who's got one? Yeah. yeah. Why should the kids have all the fun, says Janet? So I'm looking for one. Now, this, so we're allowed to open the first day, aren't we? Oh! Oh! Oh, look! Dairy milk! Chocolate in there. Oh, I might have to say that for later. <laughs> I'd like to share them because it's not just for me, is it? I haven't. So I did actually... I did actually drink... <laughs> Chocolates for everybody. So, oh look, they're like, what are they like? Can you see what they like? Marbles. Marbles. Or the World Cup. No, they're not the World Cup. What else do we have at Christmas this round? Snowballs. Christmas money. Christmas money. What did you say, James? I thought they were like footballs, don't Yeah, well, they are like footballs, but they're actually Christmas puds. So, so I'm going to put that here, and you can all, oh, we, unless we've got somebody who'd like to take them around. It's exciting, isn't it? We are now looking forward to Christmas properly, and why do we look forward to Christmas? And I know what you're all going to say, because you're going to get presents, but why do we have presents at Christmas? Why is it so special? God gave us the biggest present of all. Yes, because God gave us the biggest and best present of all on Christmas Day, which was absolutely wonderful, wasn't it? It was Jesus. So, I'm going to take my chocolate, my spent match out of the way, and I'm going to say how lovely it is that we've got this wonderful time of Christmas coming up. Oh, and I made something else. That I wonder. I must. No, I can't find it. Oh, I know it's in the other bag. It's a black bag. I made something because Barbara had put a special star on our candle that we were to light today, the first one. But I thought I'd make something else as well. But I don't think we dare put it on because Barbara says it's a bit fragile. So I'll ask Barbara to put this on. It's an emoji. An emoji, a heart, isn't it? All right, up to the minute. No. <laughs> so let's go to go there, Barbara, if, if that's all right. Yeah, this so emoji, not do it the heart. heart. Okay. Yeah, because what does emoji stand for when we look online? We do Facebook and all sorts of things. What does an emoji stand for, like a heart? Yeah. Emotions and love. Love. I don't know why the heart is always 
use for our motions for love, but it is. And that's what's going to go on our candle because our first one is all about love. And now you're going to go out to your Sunday school classes. Shall we all pray for Sylvia? Sylvia is going to bring something to us. She has prepared, she believes it's from God for each one of us. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for those who prepare your word week by week and give to us words from you. Lord, may we hear from you as Sylvia speaks. Be to her all that she needs. Bless her through the saying of those words and bless us as we hear those words being said. Lord, bless her, bless us, bless all, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Managed it. Yeah. Partly my fault. Right. Nikki Gumbel 
who most of you know, is the vicar of Holy Trinity Church, Brompton, in London, and the leader of the Alpha Course. And he says that if, we were, if he was asked to sum up what the Bible is all about, then apart from the word Jesus, he would have to choose the word love. Our passage of scripture today is from the first letter of John, chapter 4. And I'm going to read it from verses 7 to 21. And it's from um, the Life Application Bible. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is born of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God showed us how much he loved us by sending his only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. It is not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, God, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and, has lo and his love has been brought to full expression through us. And God has, has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. Furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the Father sent his Son to be the Saviour of the world. All who proclaim that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them, and they live in God. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in him. God is love. And all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment. But we can face him with confidence because we are like Christ here in this world. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of judgment. And this shows that his love has not been perfected in us. We love each other as a result of his loving us first. If someone says, I love God but hates another Christian, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we have not seen? And God himself has commanded that we must love not only him, but our Christian brothers and sisters too. Twice in our passage for today, John writes, God is love. Well, that's in verses 8 and 6. No, 16. And he says it this way, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. And anyone who loves is born of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And again in verse 16, God is love. And all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. Now, we really need to fully understand this ourselves. We need to take it on board, as they say, because it is really, really important. We need to think about it, even to meditate on it, as some do. And then, of course, once we've understood it completely, we should be able to speak about it 
confidently to the rest of the world. Knowing the Alpha course as I do, I realise that this is a portion of scripture which deeply affects Nicky Gumbel. Now we heard in the children's talk that the first candle of Advent signifies love. And of course there are many forms of love in our society. It is in fact a word that we all love to use. We love chocolate, we love music, we love the theatre, etc. Also, we use the word love when we care deeply for someone, for the love of our family or even our pets. We all know that love is important, but love in society is usually thought of now as simply by the world as just a feeling. But in reality, love is a choice and it is an action. And our love should be like his, that is, God's. In this case, in Advent, it is, we remember, the love that God has for each of us and how that love affects each one of us. Here are a few other ideas about love. This one is from Corinthians. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Love does not demand its own way. Love is not irritable. And it keeps no record of when it has been wronged. It is never glad at injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. Ne never loses faith. Is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Not easy, is it? In our John passage, it says that God is the source of that love, and mostly the world just doesn't realise it now. Nowhere does John say that love is God. Instead, it says only that God is love. It is God, therefore, who defines what love is rather than the other way around. Our world, with its shallow and selfish view of love, has turned these words around and completely contaminating, contaminated our understanding of the word love. But for a Christian, the Holy Spirit gives us the power to love. He lives in our heart, and this makes us more and more like Christ because real love leaves out the I and the me. There is absolutely no room for selfishness in the love of a Christian. Real love expects to look out for another's well-being. Real love is like God, who is holy, just and perfect. So if we truly know God, we will love as he does. Our choir practices are lovely. Well, to me they are and to other to others, I know, but I do normally speak for myself. We're only just starting up against, again after COVID, but I am, I am comfortably with a lovely group of brothers and sisters in Christ. Yesterday, I used the phrase, when you have all cleared off, meaning when you have gone out to teach the Sunday school, and was politely, politely reminded laughingly that I would be preaching today about love. I got the point. <laughs> How are we all doing, do you think, as a fellowship, as ourselves individually? You know it's good when you have to study God's word in order to give an address. It really does get you thinking deeply. And I think that all members of our preaching team here would agree with me there. God loved us enough to sacrifice his son for us. And Jesus is our example of what it really means to love. Everything Jesus did in life and death was supremely loving. The world thinks that love is what makes a person feel good. And that is all right to sacrifice moral principles and others' rights in order to obtain such love. But that isn't real love. It is the exact opposite. It's selfishness. And God is not that kind of love. In our Bibles, we find that love explains, one, why God creates, because he loves us. 
2. Why God cares. Because he loves us, he cares for sinful people. 3. Why we are free to choose. Because God wants a loving response from us. 4. Why Christ died. His love for us caused him to offer a solution to the problem of sin. And five, why we receive eternal life. That's when God's love expresses itself to us forever. Nothing sinful or evil can exist in God's presence. He is absolute goodness. And God cannot overlook, condone, or excuse sin as though it never happened. He loves us, but his love does not make him morally lax. If we trust in Christ, however, we will not have to bear the penalty for our sins. Because it says in Peter, we will be acquitted. This is what he says. He personally carried away our sins in his own body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. You have been healed by his wounds. And this is what Romans 5 verse 18 says. Yes, Adam's one sin brought condemnation upon everyone, but... Christ's one act of righteousness makes all people right in God's sight and gives them life. It's by his atoning sacrifice. That's amazing. It's wonderful. Now, here's a question. If no one has ever seen God, how can we ever know him? Well, John in his gospel, first chapter, also verse 18, said, his only son, who is himself God, is near to the Father's heart. He has told us about him. So Jesus is a complete expression of God in human form. And he has revealed God to us. When we love one another, the invisible God reveals himself to others through, his, through us. I'll say that again. When we love one another, the invisible God reveals himself to others th through us. And his love is made complete. How about that? David and I have three sons, the eldest and the youngest, born on the same day, but ten years apart, are very alike. Now, all three work, in, work by day in London, but the eldest and the youngest like to then catch the train home, away from the noise and the bustle and all that London offers. They are both happiest in their own company and have just a few real and dear friends. Our middle son is very different. He prefers to live in central London and has loads of friends who he manages to see frequently. His life is chaotic and happy and he manages without any difficulty to love each of his many different friends. Verse 12 of our passage of scripture refers to the way that we love each other. And yes, we are all very different. Whether we have three friends or 103 friends, we will need to love them because our job is to love faithfully the people that God has given us to love. And of course, that includes all of us who God has placed here in fellowship with one another. Sounds quite simple, doesn't it? We know that it isn't. But for a Christian, the Holy Spirit gives us this power to love. He lives in our heart, and this will make us more and more like Christ. When we become Christians, we receive the Holy Spirit. And God's presence is in our lives is proof that we do really belong to him. To repeat, he gives us this power to love. Romans 5, 5, 8, 9 and 2 Corinthians 1, 12, 22 
says this, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. So it's there. And 2 Corinthians, and he has identified us as his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the first installment of everything he will give us. Wow. And chapter 8, verse 9, but if you are not controlled by your sinful nature, you are controlled by the Spirit, if you have the Spirit of God living in you. It's one to think about. Romans 8 verse 16 reminds us that we can rely on his power as we reach out to others. And as we do so, we will gain the confidence that we need. For his Holy Spirit speaks to us deep in our hearts and tells us that we are God's children. God's love is a source of all human love and it spreads like fire. In loving his children, God kindles a flame in our hearts in turn, if we love others, they are warmed by God's love. It's easy to say that we love God when that love doesn't cost us anything more than a weekly attendance at church. But the real test of our love for God is how we treat the people right in front of us, our family members and our fellow believers. We cannot truly love God while we are neglecting to love those who are created in his image. God is love. So we live in the love of God. When we become Christians, we take up permanent residence in a life of love. We live in God and God lives in us. That's what it says in verse 17 of our reading. Now, this is interesting. The words love loves and love, loved, appear 27 times in that short passage. It's almost as if John is trying to tell us something here, isn't it? Well, I would say that here is the heart of the New Testament. Here is the heart of the Bible. And here is God's heart. And love is something that we all want, isn't it? Years ago, when David and I were teenagers, a new guy walked into our church in Norwich and became a Christian. He was on the way up in every sense of the word. Recently promoted to managerial level in the great firm of Coleman's Mustard. He was good looking, assured, and now he also had a faith. One day he brought his pretty new secretary, Carol, to church. It was obvious that he was smitten, but she seemed to us all a little timid and shy and with very little to say for herself. However, they became a couple and married, as did we. We left Norwich, our home city, and moved to Christchurch, which was then in Hampshire, and we invited them to come and stay. In the meantime, Carol had become a Christian. Wow! It appeared to us that she had had a complete personality transplant. She was amazing. It was the early 1970s and the charismatic movement was just getting known in deepest Hampshire. But we recognised instantly that she was full of the Holy Spirit. She was full to the brim with love, joy, peace and hope. And she could express her newfound faith so brilliantly. Well, that's how it should be, folks. Having her come to stay was a real lesson for David and me. Carol was newly living in the love of God, and it was apparent in every way. The Bible says we know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. We know and rely on the love God has for us. Like Carol, we truly start living when we know we are unconditionally loved by God because the Holy Spirit gives us the experience of God's love for us. We know and rely on the love God has for us, verse 16 says. And the Greek word used for rely is the same word as for believe. Even when we know and have experience of God's love, 
we need to keep on believing. Nicky Gumbel again says that, this is interesting, object permanence is an expression used by psychologists of a child's ability to understand that objects still exist even if they're no longer visible. We can all remember babies, can't we, and what it's like to have them or, or to, to just see them. Up to about four months old, babies don't have the capacity to believe that something exists if they can't see it. If you hide a toy, it no longer exists as far as they are concerned. But they do eventually reach a stage where if you hide a toy, they will keep on looking for it. They realise that objects do exist even when they can't see them. Well, this is also a sign of Christian maturity. When we continue to believe in God's love, even when we don't see it or feel it, we remember and we recall. As we believe in the sun, even when it isn't shining, we continue to believe in God's love, even in times of darkness, when we don't feel his love. C.S. Lewis once said, I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. So we need to develop a culture of love, of giving and receiving love. Some of us are much better that, at that than others. And some of us might be a bit easier to love than others. But do you remember what I said at the beginning of this talk? I said that to love God and to love one another is actually a commandment. The new commandment given by Jesus, in fact, to love the Lord with all your heart and soul and your neighbour as yourself. <coughs> And it is also worth repeating that love is a doing word. As a church and individually, we need to remember it more. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I'm going to have another drink now. I've got a bit of a thing on at the minute. You just want to finish off, Dave? He'll finish off for me. Well, Sylvia said, I'll repeat some of it. As a church and individually, she says, we need to remember it more. And first and foremost, when we are remembering, to remind ourselves just how much that we are loved by God. So that's what our first Christmas candle of Advent should remind us as we have lit it and as we look at it. And as the choir sang earlier, love came down at Christmas. It really did. When God, who loves us so much, sent us his Son, that whoever believes in him will inherit eternal life. How's that for love? This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loves us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. So as we come to the end of the sermon, that's all Sylvia was saying. Let's just, just have a short prayer as we bring this to a close. Dear God, as we look at the candle, on the first day as we come to prepare for this wonderful annual celebration of your gift to us, of your only Son, Jesus Christ, we long to be more loving like him. We ask now for more of your Spirit to fill our hearts afresh this morning, and we ask for our blessing on each of us today. Amen.
I'd like to end with two songs. The first one is a song called Abide With Me. Not the one that's sung them each day in the issue of the FA Cup, but the one by Matt Redmond. And the words in the bridge are, O oh love that will not ever let me go. Never let me go. Abide With Me. Shall we stand and sing?
are you Lord. You give light, you give love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you Lord.
John, have you got the uh, slide, please? Say this over one another. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace.